Uh, I want to talk about this book, Plutopia, today, and it's about the first two cities in the world to produce plutonium. And I think these are interesting cities because they show how the production of nuclear weapons changed um, Soviet and American societies by creating whole new kinds of communities and, and new definitions of citizenship, risk, and safety. Um, and I wanted to tell you how I got onto this project. I, I took a, a holiday in 2004 in the Chernobyl zone of alienation. And um, while I was there, I wrote an article about it that was published in a, in a magazine. And an editor called me up and asked me to, to write a book about the Chernobyl as a disaster, as a pivotal moment in history. And, and here's some really stupid tourist. I don't, I don't know who this person is. But I don't know who would get that close to the sarcophagus. Um, and I decided, I, I thought, you know, there's a lot of books about Chernobyl. And I, but I, and I started looking around, and I, I came across these two places, Mayak and Hanford. Uh, and I thought, you know, Chernobyl is a household word, but very few people have ever heard of Hanford. In, in Washington, more people than usual, and almost nobody's ever heard of Mayak. But these two places were like, depending on who you're asking, were two to four times um, more spilled radioactive waste than Chernobyl. Each produced at least 200 million curies of radiation. Now that's a colossal figure. So I looked into it and I thought about, you know, there's Chernobyl and there's Fukushima and those both were sort of media events. They were accidents that occurred in one day. They played out over the course of a couple of weeks while the cameras were running. The plutonium disasters were different. They were um, slow motion disasters that occurred over four decades. And they weren't accidents. They were intentional spills of radioactive isotopes on a daily basis for four decades. And when I figured that out, that to me was a really chilling realization because these were blue collar plants. Uh, thousands of people worked in them. Over the years, tens of thousands of people worked in them, and no one, until the 1980s, said anything about this. I thought, how did that happen, that, there, that, that all these people agreed to go along with this, this um, daily part of the daily working order of, of putting radioactive isotopes into the air and the ground and the water? And I started, you know, trying to figure out what that meant. And as I puzzled over these questions, I realized that both plutonium plants had spawned exclusive cities for specially chosen plant operators. And for me, these cities were the key to figuring out what went wrong. By creating what I call Plutopia, exclusive cities for working class plant operators who were paid and lived like the middle classes, plant managers purchased patriotic, compliant, and silent workers. And here's, a, here's an image of blue collar workers in, in Russia in the 50s. And, and you can see the fur coats, and you can see that look of confidence. This is not the normal kind of Soviet citizen in the 1950s. Um, and these, to me, these are, these are the citizens of Plutopia. Now, Plutopia was an attractive model for both societies. They were places where the chosen few lived, but which appeared to deliver society's stated goals, which in both countries was a classless prosperity for everyone. Plutopia basically remade the Soviet and American post-war landscapes. They militarized them, compartmentalized them, and sullied them in ways that we have yet to fully digest. And so that's the story I want to tell you today. And I want to start at the beginning um, about how plutonium was made and how they created this colossal factories, this infrastructure to produce plutonium. And as I tell the story, I'm going to go back and forth between the Soviet case and the American case because Richland, that was where the exclusive city was in eastern Washington, and Ozurs, the one in the southern Urals, were, were hooked together. They were very much a, built in reflection of one another. And in Ozurs, they used to say that if you drilled a hole all the way down through the earth, you'd come up in Richland. And that's how I imagine them, as two cities spinning on one axis over and over. Um, so the Army Corps of Engineers broke ground on the American plutonium plant in 1943, and the Soviet NKVD, or KGB generals, broke ground on Mayak plan in 1946. Now initially, American and Soviet leaders tried to produce plutonium with militarized labor in remote, secured army camp settings. And here's a picture of 
Camp Hanford. This was a, a population 60,000 built to house the construction workers for the massive factories for the Hanford plant. Now this camp had all the charms of a minimum security prison. And it had a lot of the social problems too. Fights, drinking, crime, gambling, rape, and murder. Uh, here's the women's camp. And you can almost see like, you know, over Auschwitz, Arbeit macht frei, right? Like, and they needed the barbed wire and the guards because the guys at the camp would get in and rape the women. They called them the wolves. And so the, the barbed wire and the fences were to keep the wolves at bay so the women could uh, safely live. Now they spent, this was, you know, Eastern Washington was, a, uh, was nowhere in the 1940s, and they spent millions of dollars recruiting workers, white workers across the country to come to this remote place and live and work. And, but despite the, the very good pay, uh, people hated Camp Hanford. At the peak of construction in 1944, 450 people walked off the job a day. They had real trouble keeping people. Um, at first, they only wanted to hire white workers. They thought white workers were loyal. They thought minority workers would be disloyal. Uh, but then the NAACP got involved and, and made a quota of that they had to hire 10% African-American workers. Um, and so they, in the camp, they set up separate quarters for facilities for colored people and for white workers. And um, so they basically brought Jim Crow to the Pacific Northwest. Um, and this was duplicated everywhere in bathrooms and theaters and swimming pools, all that stuff. They hired several hundred Mexican-American workers and they made them live 30 miles away in Pasco because they said that the black workers and the white workers would never live with the Mexican workers and that kind of stuff. Um, they also, to solve the labor problem, they set up a prison labor camp. Uh, this was run by Prison Industries, Inc. And they brought in conscientious subjectors from McNeil Island to do some of the work. These were white guys, they were considered secure. Um, and so they built this, this is a, a shot from the, that camp. And they patrolled these places, very, these camps very closely. And this is an amazing shot of an of a African-American worker being led into a paddy wagon. She probably said something that she wasn't supposed to or was suspected of maybe having been a member of a union or some other seditious organization and she was um, put into the paddy wagon and never seen again. And what's really amazing is that the camp photographer took this photograph. This was an official DuPont photographer who snapped this shot. Now the Soviets had something called camp construction and they built this plant between Yekaterinburg and Chelyabinsk in what is sort of the equivalent of the, of the Russian Kansas in the interior of the country. They were thinking, they wanted to deepen the interior so that the American uh, airplanes couldn't fly over and bomb the plant. Now, in 1946, the Soviets had no luxury of hired workers in, in the post-war destruction of the Soviet Union. They had lost 8 million soldiers during the war, another 16 million civilians, uh, 25 million people were homeless, and 35,000 enter enterprises and factories had been bombed during the war. And the Soviet Union was really among, even though they were among the victors, they were really among the defeated in terms of destruction. And so in 1946, they really had no business building a nuclear weapons complex. They had no cement, they had no um, steel, and they had very little labor. So the first thing they did, Stalin in 1945, handed the whole job of, of, of producing the atomic bomb to the gulag, to the prison labor system in the Soviet Union, because the gulag had bodies. And so they served up 40,000 workers in the form of POWs, German POWs, uh, and prisoners, and deportees who had been um, shoved from uh, Western uh, Russia to the Urals. Now, these hungry, ill-clad prisoners set to building the plutonium plant. And, and I think this picture shows really well how the generals who commanded these gulag um, prisoners constructed the state-of-the-art nuclear plant with the technology and tools of the Egyptian pharaohs. Um, now, from the records, it's clear that camp construction was no model of military order and prison-like control. In, the 19, in 1946, the Gulag was heading for its free fall and its destruction in the 1950s, and it was falling apart. There were not enough guards, so prisoners were left to guard one another. Criminal warlords then took over running the camps, and they ruled with a terrifying violence. Prisoners drank, fought, stole, gambled, raped, and murdered, 
civilian engineers lived in fear of the thief lords of the camps. And one guy who crossed uh, one of the thief lords was found several months after he went missing, walled up in the cement foundation of the reactor. There was no regular housing. Uh, prisoners lived in tents or in, in, in dugouts in the ground. And civilians lived in these kinds of shacks they made from found materials. So in short, I'm trying to say that uh, in both countries, um, they learned that building these massive factories with soldiers and migrant workers and prisoners who boozed and brawled and had sex and took flight in uncontrollable ways is a real problem. And originally, both Soviet and American leaders had wanted to run these plutonium plants once they got them built with militarized labor living in garrisons. But after this experience with these two labor um, construction camps, they reluctantly realized that those who could, would operate these plants could not be as volatile as the product they were going to make. And so the solution to secure production of nuclear weaponry was, strangely enough, the nuclear family. And the Soviets really followed the Americans in this. They, in order to secure trusted workers, leaders in both countries built state-funded, limited access cities for civilian plant workers who would live rooted in their nuclear families in these new atomic cities. And here are some pictures of these first plutopias. Here's Richland in the, in the late 40s, contest for who got the nicest Christmas decorations, contest for who built the best snowman, you see he's a Catholic priest. Uh, this is uh, Azorsk. Here's a Russian uh, family. Now, to secure these cities, um, Manhattan Project security agents and KGB officers set up intricate security systems. They first selected their applicants for jobs by um, choosing them for political and ethnic reliability. In Richland, the DuPont Corporation and the FBI ran background checks and they selected for whiteness. As a policy, DuPont rarely hired Jews. They also rejected African Americans, Mexican Americans, and those with leftward uh, leaning symp sympathies. And, and these are the kind of people that they um, sought to hire at the plant, indeed did. Um, in the Soviet Union, uh, enterprise leaders encircled this first plutonium city with a double row of barbed wire fence, and they gave entry passes only to employees and their immediate families. Um, they also selected for political and ethnic reliability, people who were Russians and sometimes Ukrainians. A lot of Bashkirs and Tatars, a Muslim minority, lived in that area. They did not hire any of these people. And after 40, 1948, they were seeking you know, this anti-cosmopolitan campaign. They started firing all the Jews who were in the plant. Now, these were the workers, the select workers who ran the plant. But there were other jobs that needed to be done all the time. They were constantly building, expanding these plants as the arms race escalated, and so they needed more construction workers all the time. And they needed people to work on basically what was increasingly contaminated ground, to clean up spills, to do janitorial work, and to continue construction. So they had a, another kind of residence for these lower level workers, as they called them. And these were sort of staging grounds. They lived um, not in the, in the residential plutopia that, that was exclusively for regular permanent employees, but in sort of staging grounds that were either prison camps, army garrisons, or construction camps and trailer parks. Um, and then they had another set of space that was the plants themselves that were also fenced off and guarded. And inside the, the plants, there were separate areas that were fenced off and guarded so that you could only go to areas that you um, were allowed to go in so you didn't know the whole big production story. Now, once you have all these people arranged, how do you keep workers from giving away valuable s nuclear secrets? They, there was the usual way. Security officials made employees sign security oaths and renew them continually. In Richland, to ensure silence, um, corporate police and FBI agents wiretapped phones, read mail, and cultivated ranks of informers within community organizations and schools. The KGB took similar measures, selection, security oaths, surveillance. Um, Oh, here, one second. This is showing you this sort of compartmentalized space. And they had these sort of warnings all the time. And the Soviets took security at one step farther. And for eight years, residents were locked into this special closed city and were not allowed to leave without permission. So they couldn't see their family members. They couldn't go um, skiing in the mountains or to the Black Sea for a holiday. They had to stay in the, in the closed city. 
But these security measures were only the first circle of security. Ironically, I found as I researched this book that the powerful men who were producing the world's first stocks of plutonium spent a great deal of time worrying about homes, schools, and softball teams. I wondered about that. Like Frank Mathias, who worked for the Army Corps, who built Richland, half his diary is about um, community planning, recreational programs, and housing. Now, Matthias had watched in 1944 450 workers walk off the job a day because they were dissatisfied with their living arrangements. And um, DuPont made this argument that if we're going to get good workers to come to this remote, godforsaken place, we need to pay them well. And they can't live in apartments and dorms or barracks. They have to live in nice, freestanding houses in, on large lots, kind of like those nice green suburbs in Delaware, where the DuPont officials all came from. And so they um, started to design these houses. And here's Richland. It, it, it looks, if you ever t were to go there, and maybe some of you have been there, it looks a lot like a post-war suburb. It looks like you've been there a hundred times. You've been there in California, you've been there in Chicago, you've been there in Long Island. Um, but this was built in 1943. So this is sort of the beginning of America. Suburbia is happening in this militarized setting. Um, now, what were these places like? In eastern Washington, um, they called Richland the Gold Coast. It was a strange place. The federal government owned all the land and the property, and first DuPont and then General Electric managed the city. DuPont hired an architect who designed the houses, the shopping centers, and the residential developments. DuPont built and ran the town hospital, the best in the region, which only workers and their families could go to. DuPont and GE selected businesses, gave them monopolies in town, and then so that they would not gouge their workers, they did price checks. They set prices and checked to make sure that they weren't spending too much or charging too much. They uh, set up a town newspaper and censored it. Uh, in the absence of tax revenue, GE allocated federal funds for Richland schools and parks and bus service and hospital. Uh, workers who paid no taxes received 30% more than um, workers in surrounding counties. And this kind of, all this rubbed locals the wrong way. And a lot of observers, who, newspaper reporters who came and congressmen who came, they said, what is this place? Is it socialism? Is it fascism? It's government owned, it's state run, there's no free enterprise, there's no free press, there's no local government. But people who lived in Richland, they were fine with it. They didn't mind this all, at all. And, um, and they especially loved that white male employees could rent a modern uh, freestanding house with all utilities and maintenance for $35 a month. They paid a half or a third as much as locals did in um, neighboring Pasco. Here's a shack in Pasco in the, what was the, the black ghetto. If you were to rent this, as opposed to that beautiful house in Richland, you paid $100 a month rather than $35 a month. You had no uh, plumbing, you had a spigot on the street and an outhouse. So it was a great deal and people loved it. And in fact, the contrast between Richland and the surrounding tiny, dusty railroad towns were stark. Here's Pasco. And across the inland west at this time, little ran ranch and railroad towns were going bust all the while that Richland boomed. And I think this inspired this sort of insensitive, irrational love of the bomb. And, and they still use the mushroom cloud as the, as the town mascot for the high school team. <clears throat> now, in the Soviet Union, since the 1930s, business leaders have been acutely aware of problems caused by uh, not enough consumer goods and low pay. They had seen strikes and riots because of price hikes and shortages of consumer goods. And they had a terrific problem during the war of keeping people on the job. When goods got scarce, workers tend to take a hike and try to find a job elsewhere. So they too saw affluence as a way to secure a labor force, a reliable labor force. And Stalin himself told the director of the um, atomic bomb program, Igor Korchatov, he said, you know, Russia is very poor, but surely in Russia a few hundred people can live well very well with their own dachas and their own cars. And he told Kurchatov to go back to the Urals and spend all he wanted on a nice new town. And that's indeed what Kurchatov did. Um, he set out to build not just a bomb, but a wonderful city. 
And here are some images of this city as it developed. Um, in the southern Urals, people called the residents of this town the chocolate eaters because they had unusual supplies in the post-war period of chocolate and sausage that nobody else in the provinces ever had. And by the early 50s, they had more than chocolate. Uh, Korchatov, that's a statue of him, commissioned Leningrad architects to build secretly in the thick forest excellent modern apartment buildings with electricity and plumbing. They constructed theaters, swimming pools, preschools, hair salons, parks, and best of all, in, um, the wages were 50% higher, but best of all, they had these consumer goods. And you can see these shops stocked with uh, plums from Romania and Finnish overcoats and German shoes. One woman remembered, we had the feeling that we had already lived under communism. There was everything in the stores from black caviar to crab. Now, stocked stores and good housing were an unbelievable luxury in the 40s in the Soviet Union. Outside the closed city were towns that had industrial kind of settlements that had names such as asbestos and asbestos II. And workers would finish their shifts and they would wait in line to buy gray macaroni and then they would disappear, stooping and coughing into their basement dugouts. In the nearby industrial city of Chilyabinsk in 1948, two to 300 people lined up at three in the morning to buy bread and they are still there 24 hours later. So for many residents who came from hard scrabble provincial towns in the Soviet Union or the USSR, residency in Ozyorsk or in Richland was akin to winning the golden ticket. It meant a person had arrived in the kind of material comfort and prosperity that few had expected in their lifetimes. Ralph Myrick remembered his childhood in a New Mexico company mining town of, plaked, of packed clay and slag heaps. And when DuPont settled his family into this two bedroom prefab, his mother broke down in tears of joy. She had never lived in a place so new, so clean with utilities and plumbing. She had never lived in a place so affordable. Ralph's father hadn't finished high school, and he, Ralph said his father worried a lot. He worried that the plant would close after the war. He worried that at some point the supply of plutonium would be satiated and the plant would close. He worried that his children would say something, or his wife or he would say something, and he would lose his job at the plant. And everybody knew if you lost your job at the plant, you had a month to move out of town. And Ralph knew that nowhere else with his skills and his education could he live so well as in Richland. Now in the Soviet Union, uh, the contrast between life in the closed city and life outside was so great that residents used gulag slang. They called the outside world the big world. Um, and it wasn't difficult to lose your place in the socialist paradise either. If somebody drank too much, slept with other men's wife, they took it up in party meetings and threatened people with eviction. If your kid dressed like Elvis Presley, listened to the Voice of America, they would be sent out to a boarding school outside of the town, never to return. There was a big explosion in 1957 in this town and people got nervous. They saw the, the fallout going and they quit their jobs in droves. Several thousand people quit their job. But I found that after a couple of months, letters started streaming in saying, I was stupid. Please take me back. I can't live out here in the big world. So I think that tells you that sort of these places charm was so arresting and so seductive that people chose to remain in this Eden even when they realized or suspected they were putting their health at risk. So what I'm trying to say is it took, a, it took a village or maybe a small city to produce the few kilograms of plutonium necessary for a nuclear bomb. And these cities were prize winning cities. They, um, Richland won prizes for planning and housing and educational achievement. Um, and it really led society in charting out post-war American suburbia. Ozyorsk also won prizes for creating what the Soviets had been trying to produce since the 30s, which was a socialist city, a prize-winning kind of city that um, people could live in communism and, and prosperity and happiness. But the tranquil prosperity of these places sort of belied the fact that they were fronts in an unannounced Cold War that was going on, and that they were primary targets. It also overlooks the fact that all the while these people were enjoying these places, scientists were quietly contaminating the surrounding environment with millions of curies of radioactive waste. 
And I want to tell you a little bit about plutonium production because it's the messiest stop on the assembly line for nuclear weapons. A few kilograms of plutonium requires 100 tons of uranium and produces hundreds of thousands of gallons of radioactive waste. From 1948 to 1993, the Mayak and Hanford plants each dumped radioactive waste into the ground, the rivers, the airstreams, as part of the normal operating order. Because the military controlled these plants, knowledge of this dumping was not known by the public, nor were all research and health programs at the plant were pretty much uh, sequestered away. They did not, this knowledge did not reach the public, neither in the dictatorial Soviet Union or in the democratic United States. In Richland, medical researchers suppressed evidence that local milk, river fish, sheep in the pastures, and sage in the front lawn registered alarming levels of radiation. They did their research secretly at times. Uh, scientists dressed up as cowboys and went out and tested the thyroids of sheep. They wrote in classified documents that alerting residents to these problems would cause undue alarm and mass hysteria. DuPont set up a safety exhibit to promote an image of well-being and care. And you could go to these safety exhibits. You still can go. And there's lots of bathing beauties and door prizes. Um, in Azure, they took security uh, even farther. They removed the plant in the city from the map. Uh, offer you to try to find it. They banned the words radiation and plutonium, and workers had to guess that they were making nuclear weapons. So what's the effect of living on a radiated landscape and working in, in plants that were contaminated? It was really the first workers who got sick. Um, oh, and this is the, the Ticha River. In 1949, um, in Russia, they ran out of underground tanks to store highly radioactive waste. And so rather than stop production, they decided that we'll just dump it in the river. They did that. They dumped from 1949 to 1951 3.2 million curies of waste into the river. And downstream, 28,000 people were living, drinking from that river, uh, washing with it, bathing in it, and fishing in it. And I'll get back to this river in a bit. Now, the first people to get sick at the plant were workers, or the first people in general to get sick were workers. And some died, and their deaths were attributed to natural causes. And I found, strangely enough, in, in the Hanford records, two autopsies, twice, I found two autopsies of one man, and I wondered about that. And one case, a 1952 case, there was a, a, a guy who, by the name of Ernst Johnson, he, he was working at the plant, he was a janitor, he was 45 years old, and he didn't feel well at work, and he went home, laid down on the couch, and died. His wife called the GE-run hospital, and the GE-paid doctor comes over and says, I'll do an autopsy, and the autopsy report says that the man died of an aneurysm. But the wife was kind of suspicious. She had seen on the corpse burns on her husband's arms. The doctor said, I don't know what those were about. Some co-workers came by and said, your husband got dosed at work. We saw it. And then the FBI was following her around town, wherever she went. So as she was returning to Chicago to, for the funeral, and she took the body with her, she dropped the body off at the Cook County coroner and said, what do you think my husband died? The second autopsy report by the coroner said that this man died of radiation poisoning. You can see the burns on the arms. You can see the damage to the heart. And he said, some important evidence from the body is missing, meaning organs had been removed and put somewhere else. Now, soon after that, in the archive, is a correspondence between this coroner and coroner, um, the Cook County coroner and GE lawyers who quickly flew to Chicago to try to get this coroner to redact and retract his autopsy. He refused to do that, so the GE lawyers went to the Washington State Labor Board in Olympia and got them to redact all information about radiation from this man's autopsy. The wife never got compensation, and to this day, Hanford says that they have no fatalities due to radiation incidents in the whole history of the plant. Now, in the Soviet Union, and this, this is, these are doctors of the Soviet plant, the plants were built in haste and parsimony by hungry prisoners, and many buildings were really poorly designed for this kind of work. Uh, there was no money in the first years for rubber gloves, rubber boots for workers. In one lab, there were not even enough stools, so workers sat on wooden boxes filled with radioactive waste. Doctors had no idea of the kind of doses that their um, workers were getting because that was classified information, so the doctors were sort of working blindly. 
And so they learned to study the bodies of their patients and they studied the blood cells and they got to they could detect when a person was about to have what they called chronic radiation syndrome, which is a syndrome only found in the Russian Urals so far, which is from long-term exposure to low doses of radiation. And the symptoms are kind of an early radiation aging, organ failure, severe joint pains, chronic fatigue, anemia, diabetes, and other immune disorders. Um, now, several dozen women who worked at the radiochemical plant came down with this chronic radiation syndrome in the early 50s. And they were young women who had been given a clean bill of health in their 20s when they signed on the plant. Five years later, they're creeping around, barely able to move. And so they started to treat them and study them. And that's when they came up with this diagnosis. These young women died um, by the, before they turned 30. And about, eventually about 23% 23, 23 of the first plant workers were diagnosed with this chronic radiation syndrome. And this got the Soviets really nervous because they needed these trained workers. They were rare, they were valuable, they knew secrets, and they didn't want them going out somewhere and being an invalid. So they started to care for their workers. And one way to care for their workers was to, whenever there was a particularly dirty job at the plant, a spill to clean up, a cracked pipe that was dripping radioactive fluid, um, some construction work to do on contaminated ground with, with smokestacks going over it, they called in prisoners and soldiers. These people didn't have to be monitored. They didn't have to wear radiation badges. There was no, as temporary workers, there was no limitation on how much radiation they could get. They worked temporarily. They worked for a couple of years and then moved on, taking with them all kinds of radiation that they had ingested and any subsequent health problems. So therefore, the plant workers look healthier than they really indeed would have been. That it, it becomes sort of a, because of these temporary workers living in these staging grounds who are never considered nuclear workers, creates this picture of a healthy pink plutonium workforce, and the, the cities themselves especially. Now this was just a mirage, but it was a useful mirage, um, because people really believed in the safety of their plants. In fact, beyond a few isolated cases and some rumors about glowing in the dark and impotency, there were almost no social movements in either of these places um, until the 1980s. I found a couple of KGB agents who were whistleblowers in the 60s, but that was it. And that was kind of strange, I thought. And even after Chernobyl and the release of a great deal of documents about both Hanford and Mayak, um, the, the residents of these towns still fought against acknowledging the connection between the plutonium plants and any local health problems. I wondered about that too. In both cities, these, these residents um, counted up the number of PhDs and they were very proud of their education. But so why did they agree to live in ignorance for so long? Um, Soviet residents had no electoral politics, no independent media, but the residents of Richland lived in a thriving democracy. Why did the famed checks and balances fail so that a disaster surpassing Chernobyl occurred in America's heartland. And I think the answer to this question lies in these plutopian towns themselves. They were so prosperous, so solicitous, so good at simulating the functions of a participatory society that they proved to be successful incubators of loyalty, patriotism, and a blind faith in authority. And this, these successful towns also gave the local leaders a lot of credibility. The orderly, universal well-being of family-centered Ozorsk and Richland, where there was the average age was 26, there were no indigent, no elderly, no unemployed, no crime, gave people a sense of superiority and of safety. Um, and the Plutopia residents enumerated their superiority in a lot of different ways. They counted up their higher birth rates, longer life expectancies, higher average incomes and educational le levels. They counted how many appliances they had how they had larger living space and ate more milk and potatoes and dairy products. And they saw these indicators as validation of their towns and of their leaders and of their community's safety. And in some ways, their superior consuming status did keep these people safer. Rather than having to live off the radiated landscape, um, as did neighboring farmers, people in Richland and Ozorsk purchased their goods from 
places that came from far away. The milk specifically came from Minnesota to supply Richland. Uh, they drank water that was monitored, and the air was monitored too. In the Soviet Union, gynecologists even performed prophylactic abortions if a fetus looked kind of funny. And so that made the birth rate and the infant mortality rate look better than it might have been otherwise. So the assertions that Plutopia residents was healthier were in fact true because they were younger, more affluent, and had far better health care, but also because as modern consumers, they did not live off the radioactive landscape. And they would say things like, you know, relativize things, uh, the plutonium plant is safer than driving your family car or using your home appliances. Now in contrast, downstream from the Mayak plant, villagers lived on the radioactive Ticha River. They bathed in it, watered their crops, and uh, cooked with it. And in 1951, uh, plant scientists finally went down and, and, and took some readings, and they determined that um, everyone and everything was dangerously radioactive. They actually stepped away from the children that they monitored because these children were so radioactive. Uh, they issued a ban on using the river and um, told the villagers they could not drink from it or, or go anywhere near it. But that was impossible because they had no wells. And so the villagers continued to go and draw water from these, um, from these, from the Ticha River. They also had nothing else to eat other than their own homegrown crops. Um, as the years went by, people in the downstream villages fell ill with cancers, leukemias, thyroid tumors, infertility, and heart diseases. And their children suffered, too, from an uncommonly high number of birth defects. Here's if you go around um, this area and people are selling food on the roadside, all you had to do was put your Geiger counter there. Here I am, nervously trying to avoid eating a homegrown meal. Uh, the fellow and the boy in the back is about 13, and he had a vocabulary of about 60 words. And this is a, the next photo I'm going to show you is from a, a, a warehouse in Chelyabinsk where that was part of the medical research facility where they, they um, were testing. They, they basically turned this village, Muslumovo, on the Ticha River into a natural experiment where they followed medically the three generations of residents on this river to see they tested their blood every year and they took medical exams. And they also kept a storehouse of babies that didn't turn out. And there's about... I don't know, five or six hundred of these babies in jars in, this, in the one room that I saw. So I'm going to get rid of that photo. Um, now, the illnesses um, in eastern Washington were similar in a way. Um, and I would hear the same kinds of stories about these sort of vague complaints that ran through generations. And in fact, I just had dinner with a couple of people tonight, and they told me about similar kinds of problems that ran through generations. And then earlier today, I was interviewed by a reporter who grew up in Spokane, and he told me about his entire family riddled with cancers and birth defects, just by the by. I don't know what that is about, but, they, it, but to me, as I worked on this project, the fact that these same kinds of complaints are occurring across the globe in two different kinds of communities that are not in communion with each other was striking. Now, after 1986, when Chernobyl blew the lid off these places, these local farmers started to pop up and say, we're sick. We're sick, we think, from these plants. And the officials and scientists in both the Soviet Union, Russia but at that point, and, and the United States, said that these people were not sick from the plants, that they were sick because they drank too much, they were inbred, they had poor diets, or they just had radiophobia. They just attributed everything to radiation. They said they, weren't, they didn't have chronic radiation syndrome, but they were just chronic welfare cases looking for a handout. And it was easy to discredit the poor farming neighbors of the plutonium plants. Uh, residents of Richland and Azurisk had long viewed their poor farming neighbors with scorn and condescension. And they saw themselves as the chosen people. And if, and if you didn't make it the grade in the, in the plutonium city, it's because you weren't good enough. So this kind of, these spatial practices that were set up, the staging grounds and the special cities, appeared to make the natural order look natural. But in fact, they were um, sort of created, manufactured spatial zones that were set up and then helped make um, this plutonium disaster invisible in many ways. Now in Richland in the 1950s, big crowds gathered to see Ronald Reagan uh, sponsor and host the GE Theater. And Reagan demonstrated the total new electric kitchen. Um, and he 
transmitted the GE endorsed message that consumer freedom was the cornerstone of democracy. And in Richland, where residents had given up most of their political freedoms, but had a great deal of buying power with all their extra wages, this message especially made sense. Consumerism served as a surrogate for freedoms residents forfeited when they agreed to live in the plutonium city depended on one product. By living in Richland, res residents took a pass on the rights to self-government, free speech, free assembly, and an independent press. They also gave up control over their bodies as they placed their urine samples each week on the front stoop and sent their kids through whole body scanners. As consumers, however, Richland residents won back a bit of their voice, lost voice and power. For it was over questions of consumption that they, were most, they could be the most vocal and, they, and there's big fights about dog walking and leash laws and parking. And these issues seem trivial, but it was really, um, meant a great deal because it simulated for them the, the motions of American democracy for which these people were putting their lives on the line. And I say that these people in Richland were not alone. Um, across the post-war United States, people turned their backs on long-held American values of equal access and opportunity in order to, pr pr to protect their property values in federally subsidized, limited access suburban communities just off limited access national defense highways. Richland simply epitomized the post-war inequities, exclusions, and hierarchies of suburbanizing America. There are lots of Americans who are happy to give up their rights and freedoms in order to exchange them for exclusive tickets to their own version of Plutopia. Now in the Soviet Union, um, leaders also use consumer prerogatives to keep their chosen citizens happy. And they created, generally across the country, zones of prosperity, and that would be like prime cities like Moscow and Leningrad, amidst greater zones of poverty, and that was the collective farm system. All the whole countryside where collective farmers were made to stay on their farms, they were not allowed to leave, and they lived in dire poverty. Um, so if you were sitting in Ozursk and you only left it for the special resorts reserved just for plutonium workers. Um, the idea that Khrushchev's promise that the Soviet Union would achieve communism and surpass it came to be, seemed to be realized. The Soviets had achieved communism, if only in one city, if off the map. And for many people, the consuming superiority of their lives in Ozursk spoke to them of the superiority of the Soviet Union in general and of the communist experiment. Um, and, and so people really believed in the Soviet Union. They were loyal and patriotic to it in quite genuine ways. As much as you hear about dissidents in the Soviet Union, there were no dissidents in, in Ozursk. Um, in the 1970s, they took polls and they found that the young generation were even more hawkish and supportive of the nuclear establishment than their parents. In, 19, uh, in 2000, they took a, a vote and said, do you want to get rid of the, the gates and the fence around the city and the checkpoint with the guards? Overwhelmingly, they voted to keep the guards and the gates and um, remain in a state of, of sort of a gilded cage. Um, they wanted to keep the riffraff out, they said. So in conclusion, I, I think the most important element to keeping the secrets of the plutonium disasters was the cultivation of these thriving consumer cultures. In both cities, blue collar workers were paid and lived like the middle classes and in a way that their allegiances shifted upwards towards their superiors and their bosses. By zoning territories into zones of privilege and zones of poverty, um, it kept alive for Soviet urbanites the myth of socialism just as white affluent suburbs maintain the mirage of universal opportunity in American democracy. In these highly zoned, um, highly controlled zones of privilege, the space for questioning authority narrowed greatly. Now zoning off these areas also created an epidemiological mirage that nuclear production was safe. In the plutonium cities, the exchange for, of political for consumer fr freedom led to unannounced plutonium disasters and, and we've yet to really digest the environmental, genetic and, and social impact um, of that process. So to finish up, I just want to leave you with one last photo. Um, it was taken in Ozursk in, in 2000 uh, at a school and it's a school play. <laughs> 
And I think this photo um, illustrates one of the major findings of geneticists working in the late 40s in the United States. And they said quite clearly that the lasting effects of radiation would be genetic mutations that would strike especially the third generation of offspring to be exposed. And I think you can see from this photo how the welfare states that created plutonium cities also produced people who became welfare cases themselves. Thanks. So do you see a parallel between your research versus America that you are living in today? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm trying to point out, when I, when I say thriving democracy, I, I mean that rhetorically. That's a rhetorical device to, talk, to get you to question it. Um, I think there was real problems with creating these sort of um, zones where uh, the federal government, the biggest welfare program in the, in the United States, in the history of the United States, is subsidizing post-war housing for people who could get the loans and who could get the loans. Straight white families. Until about the 1980s, and, well, to this day, there's a real inequity in who can get loans. And if you're, if you're white, you can get a loan. And that loan is subsidized by the federal government. And then your entire infrastructure and the roads that take you there are, are subsidized by taxpayer dollars, leaving behind people in blighted areas in inner cities to live in poverty and generations of poverty. That choice was made in the post-war period. And I'm I guess I'm trying to point out that those kinds of choices, all, you know, the kind of choices people made in Richland, which now we look back on and go, oh my God. We were all kind of making those choices. Lots of Americans were. And, and so this notion of financial, national security and then financial security are foremost before the security of our bodies. And I think that, that speaks to your Monsanto question. As long as it makes money and offers financial security, uh, okay, Th those are our priorities. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Russ Walker. I work at King 5 uh, Television been working with a uh, reporter there, Susanna Frame, on a series of stories, stories excuse me, on uh, Hanford, on a particular issue out there. And one thing that really surprised me about, um, about your talk tonight and the boosterism and the, the pro-nuclear uh, plutopia communities is how much it's not really that changed today. Um, the boosterism in Richland is just as intense. They're outright hostile to a free press. In fact, um, we've offered our coverage of, um, uh, uh, of Hanford to the TV stations in Richland. They won't take it. Um, and the newspaper reporter there has never acknowledged any of our reporting, which is, uh, I mean, in, <laughs> I'm very proud of, and it uh, very much exposes the sort of um, cavalier attitude that I think uh, the government and the industry there have about um, people. So. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, nuclear weapons are still being produced and refurbished today, although at a lower rate in the Cold War. Have the conditions around the production of that nuclear material or the refurbishment of the weapons improved over what we might have seen in the 70s and 80s? I wish I could say it had. No. We're spending more now on nuclear weapons than at the height of the Cold War. That's one thing. We all have this, we're this illusion that the Cold War is over, and so we stop producing in nuclear weapons and spending money on nuclear weapons. That's not the case at all. Uh, maintaining the existing stock, massive stockpile is, is extremely expensive, and um, they're designing new kinds of sets of, um, of weapons. And no, I mean, uh, I don't know if you caught that story about Oak Ridge, where the three activists um, about a year ago decided to make a point um, and they were sort of religious activists, and one was a nun, and she was 82 years old, and they had some wire cutters, and they went at night into this Oak Ridge, which is the biggest stockpile of uranium in the country, and they cut through four fences, and they were able to put graffiti on the walls of this Fort Knox of uranium before they were caught by the security officials three hours later. So what the DOE, the Department of Energy, says is, you know, we give the job to our contractors, we're proud of our contractors, we trust them, and then we don't worry about oversight and regulation. Re you know, government regulation is bad. So they're leaving these contractors to um, make millions of dollars in, in bonuses, and they're not really watching what they're doing. So there's a, a great inflation um, and, a, and a very low quality control going on in the nuclear industry in general. Okay, so thank you so much for being here. And uh, Dr. Brown will be signing books at the signing table just over here. <laughs>
Thank you. My name's Ed Bricker. I was a whistleblower at the Hanford nuclear site. Um, my grandfather worked there in construction. My other grandfather worked there as a security guard. My dad worked there as an electrician. Uh, I went to Richland High School, was a Richland bomber. Um, grew up breathing the air, <laughs> drinking the water, swimming in the, the river, and basically believing in the, uh, the defense work that we were doing at Hanford. Um, I worked out at the site, was one of the first whistleblowers uh, at Hanford. I worked undercover for uh, Senator John Dingle's committee, or Congressman John Dingle's committee, working with Jeff Hodges, and then I worked with uh, um, Bob Alvarez, who uh, was a staffer with John Glenn's committee. I had to do that in order to protect myself because I was uh, concerned about waste, fraud, and abuse at the nuclear site, environmental issues I saw. I was one of the first wor workers to complain about having uh, my lungs exposed to tank vapors at the site. Um, and I since uh, have been diagnosed with COPD and asthma as a result of breathing those vapors. Um, I also had tank waste splashed on my arm and leg and developed cancer as a result. Uh, and I'm still in a protected uh, uh, battle with the Department of Labor uh, and basically the Department of Energy over these exposures. And at the time I was uh, called crazy and made a lot of fun of because of, in particular, those uh, lung exposures that I had at Hanford. Um, it's still a production first, safety second mentality at Hanford, but now it applies to cleanup. Um, I, I, I also was hired by the state of Washington to regulate uh, the Department of Energy and the nuclear sites in Washington and suffered uh, severe harassment as a result of my uh, bringing up safety concerns with my management, in particular building of facilities that I thought were improperly designed. I wrote a letter to Governor Gary Locke that was lost and the, uh, I believe my concerns at least were never adequately addressed. Uh, I complained about the design of the current glassification facility there. Um, uh, there is, uh, th I have some very real concerns like uh, former presidents uh, Truman and Eisenhower about the military industrial complex and how it oversees uh, these facilities, these ex-production facilities that are now in clean. Um, and I, I believe that contracts are often rewarded to maintain the uh, m maintain uh, long-term relationships with these companies. Uh, for instance, uh, when the B-1 uh, bomber program was winding down, Rockwell was rewarded with the contract to oversee Hanford. And under Rockwell, I suffered tremendously uh, and uh, I believe was uh, retaliated against for uh, voicing concerns about waste, fraud, and abuse, and environmental uh, problems at the site. Um, there's supposedly this openness. Um, there was a, I, Kate mentions Jim Alba in her book. Jim was a former Richland a bomber like I was. Uh, he preceded me a few years uh, uh, in graduation from Hanford. Uh, Jim was the manager of safety quality assurance and safety at Hanford and I was bringing to him many of the problems at the plutonium plant but none of the problems seemed to be getting fixed and then the next thing I knew Jim was gone and then later on he resurfaced working for the Boeing's company and then under uh, his uh, oversight of the Dreamliner program it's my understanding that there were problems uh, voiced many not many but years ago with the battery issue problem and it makes me wonder uh, how well he addressed those issues and if it was uh, addressing those issues in a similar fashion as it was with my issues about health and safety and, and design problems at the plutonium plant that I saw. Um, I might add that I was also voicing concerns as a health physicist working for the, the, the state of Washington. I encourage all within the sound of my voice
to get copies of my depositions and read those. Um, one of the most onerous settlement agreements in the history of the state of Washington, in fact it is, uh, in the opinion of my attorney, um, was generated as a result of my lawsuit against them for harassment, of which they settled out of court for. And the settlement agreement was just recently upheld in the state uh, court of appeals. I encourage people to, to read that agreement. It, it, it's, it's very, very uh, horrific. It's very onerous. And it, it does not bode well for whistleblowing in the state of Washington. And I encourage citizen activists uh, to uh, support uh, whistleblower legislation that will protect us in the future. Had we listened to whistleblowers, um, we would not quite possibly be in the, um, the fix we're in today. I mean, we had the, the saving, and, saving and loans crisis that precipitated one of the worst, well, the worst recession in the history of the United States. There was whistleblowers blowing the whistle on that uh, years before it occurred. Yeah, and those guys, a lot of those guys went, a lot of the uh, criminals in that situation, uh, you know, actually went to jail. But none of these people, you know, these Wall Street people that brought down the economy in 2008, you know, have gone to jail. No, no, they've profited enormously, and that's what we're talking about is, that's what drives, I encourage those uh, listening to, again, get that book, uh, Friends in High Places. Yeah, it's about uh, written, Bechtel. written about Bechtel and read that. Bechtel threatened to sue, it's my understanding, the author, until he said, okay, if you do sue, so, I'll open up all my notes and my history and my archives, and then you can call those people, and some of whom were Bechtel, it's my understanding, Bechtel employees. Yeah. And then Bechtel backed down. Um, but yeah, there is this, uh, it, this for profit uh, mentality, and the oftentimes people suffer. And in this case, you're, you're seeing uh, the health and safety of generations suffering, uh, environmental disasters um, that are terrible, and uh, uh, lives lost, uh, careers lost. Uh, I've given up, you know, a couple careers uh, to protect the citizens of the United States and the state of Washington, and it's been a worthy battle, but I just, I can't do it alone. So there's, there's a need for citizen activists out there to pick up the torch and, and carry forward. All right, well, thanks for having a conscience. Yeah, thank you.